Hello everybody and welcome to the third week of our lecture series called Designing the Sound uh, where we are investigating and having a discussion on the, um, on the relationship that we have with sound as humans and also in the design environment. Uh, tonight uh, we're lucky enough to have uh, Ian Knowles from Arab Acoustics who I have worked with in various capacities as an architect and also a sound artist. I think we've collaborated now for the last 10 years on, on different acoustic projects, some being wild and crazy, like putting standing waves in art galleries and going all the way up to full-on um, concert halls. Ian has a vast experience of acoustic design, and um, he's probably forgotten more than I'll ever know on the subject. So, thank you. So I'm, I'm very thrilled and proud to introduce Ian Knowles from Arab Acoustics. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you'll probably be asleep in 10 minutes because it's so hot in this room, but um, as you probably witnessed, uh, we had a technology failure, so I'm using Paul's machine as well, which I'm not familiar with, so I'll just push buttons and hope that we can actually make some progress. Oh, there we go. Somebody once said, is acoustics art or science? For a long time, people said, oh, it's a black art. Um, and I think probably the reason it was a black art was because Nobody seems to know when things worked and when things didn't work. Um, and it's only really in the last 30 years or so that there's been a, a pretty good correlation between science and what we're actually now designing and what works. Prior to that, it was hit and miss. Some things worked, some things didn't work. Um, but I think an art is a science with all the set of variables. It make, does, does make acoustics an art. Now, what I'm going to tell you, what I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you. Um, this is what I'm going to talk about a little bit about our acoustics. We're going to talk about concert hall design. We're going to talk about Sound Lab, which is a, a, a facility we have in London, but we also have it in uh, about 800 offices around the world, where we can listen to what our design will sound like before we build them. And then I'm going to run through a few project examples there. Um, the Royal Welsh College Music and Drama, the second one down, was actually one which Paul talked about in the first lecture. Um, and the last one, the, the Buddha concert, which I'm going to talk about, is the one that we opened uh, just recently in Norway. So, Arab acoustics, what do we do? Well, in the built environment, <coughs> room acoustics, obviously, um, sort of goes without saying that we do that. Um, Integral to room acoustics is also mechanical services noise control. If you sit and listen to this room now, you can hear the fans in the projector, you can hear the ventilation system, you can hear the traffic outside. If this was a concert hall, it would be too noisy. It would be distracting, right? So that's really key. Vibration isolation of actual structures. We put our concert halls on springs quite often to isolate them from the ground so that we don't get rumble from underground trains and from traffic outside and from all that sort of stuff. Really complicated, really expensive. You need um, to be absolutely sure you need to do it. You're talking millions of pounds to do this. <coughs> Electroacoustics, PA systems. Almost any concert hall these days has to be able to put on amplified music of some sort, world music, conferences probably, um, and having a good quality sound system is important, and that's one of the other things we design. Environmental noise, obviously, uh, I won't talk about that at all, but a huge amount of our work now is in uh, infrastructure work um, and public art, stuff that we get almost no money for at all, but it's stuff that we enjoy doing. Um, uh, Sonic art installations, the, the like of which uh, uh, the harmonic bridge of the tent and compare it to the things where we actually help out some artists. We don't help out the <coughs> There are some concert halls that we designed, lots of them, as I say, the Royal Welsh. Uh, what else have we got there? Basin Stoke. Basin Stoke. Bridge Waterboard in Manchester. Um, there's some more. This one started off Arab Acoustics Snake Mortons, it's a very first concert hall design. And it's actually designed by Arab Associates, the uh, architectural practice in the days well before uh, acoustics was um, being thought of. The King's Place in London, built in court, uh, holding up hall. So, 
And this is the selection. We've actually designed over 500 performing arts buildings over the last 30 years. But when it comes to opera houses, we are the preeminent acquisition of choice in the world. We've done more 19th and 20th century opera house designs than anybody else. Um, and these are just a few of them. Uh, Oslo Opera, fabulous, uh, fabulous building. Um, Sydney Opera House, of course, started it off. We didn't actually do the acoustics, which were diabolical, but we did do the structure, which is rather iconic. Um, Klein Ball, obviously the Royal Opera House uh, coming up. So loads and loads of concert rooms, loads and loads of opera houses. Lots of experience. It's all condensed. We have a very small number of people in the house. There's only, in the UK, there's only 50 of us, and we're across five offices. Now, when you consider that Arab Baxter employs 12,500 people, we're just a tiny little decimal point. But we have all of the sexy stuff. <laughs> so, we're going to talk a little bit about constant design. This is going to be a bit boring, <coughs> this bit. <coughs> now, what we need to do when you start to design a concept well, is to consider what's important. And there are 10 key elements to describing the concert hall, to describing sound quality and what's important to what it is. Um, and these are reverberance, strength and loudness, clarity, intimacy, spaciousness and envelopment, timbre, tone quality, balance, and blend, dynamic range, and freedom from acoustic faults like focusing on performer conditions. Now there are some acousticians who don't give a monkey about that. Um, actually they went out of business as it um, Their view is that the audience is what's, what's important, not the musicians. But we take a, a counter view that actually, if the musicians are comfortable, they play well, they play better. So a better performance is given and everyone enjoys themselves more. So actually, I would probably put that as the one of the most important things. So I'm going to go through some of these in more detail in terms of the geometric things within the space that affect these criteria. All right? So what affects reverberance? It's essentially, put simply, it's the equal volume of the space and the amount of absorption in it. It's really just those two things. <coughs> so the bigger the room, the longer the reverberation time for a given amount of absorption you put in there. And in a concert hall, most of the absorption is provided by the audience or the seats of the audience are present. This is a direct correlation between the volume and the seating area. And as a rule of thumb, those of you who've got this paper and pen, 10 to 12 cubic metres per person is the perfect for a symphonic room. 9 to 10 cubic metres per person for a recital room. If you're doing conference or amplified use or theatre use, it's more like 5 cubic metres per person. So there you have from 5 to 12 cubic metres per person difference between a theatre show and a concert hall, which is why when I come on right at the very end, if I'm still awake, the difference in Buddha between putting on a theatre show and then changing that space physically to be a concert hall has been such a challenge. So that's important, um, and places like the Barbican and the Festival Hall just simply haven't got enough volume for the number of seats. It's as simple as that, which is why they're not reverberating. Um, so it's the ratio that I've just been through. Um, the height is important. Reverberance develops at high level in the space. Essentially where the audience plane aren't, because they're the absorption. So you need to be out of that plane for the reverberance to develop. So tall rooms are good. Surface materials are key, obviously. You don't want to provide lots of absorption. Um, seat design, critically important, especially in rooms that might not be used with a full occupancy. I mean, these days, you put on a classical concert, you might get 30% of the audience that turning up. The rest of the time is empty. And so, you want, don't want the acoustic of the room to change depending on occupancy. So you design the seat to mimic a person. And obviously, occupancy and size. Room shape, millions of different shapes. Um, there's now a, um, uh, a consensus, really, 
Shoe boxes work very well. Double Q shoe box. Vineyard Terrace is a uh, started with a Berlin Philharmonie. It's a a change to um, a shoe box, and as much as you get more people in closer to the platform, but you can only use it for classical music because you can sit all the way around the orchestra. As soon as you want to put a rock and pop band on, you have to put a black in, and half the audience you can't sell their seats because they're behind the stage. So actually, it's a diabolical design for a multi-purpose space. Strength and loudness. The fewer seats you have, the stronger the sound is. Because the seats provide the absorption, they control the loudness. You need low upholstery. The width is really important in a concert hall. Lateral energy is called. Um, your brain can't decide what's coming straight at you and what's coming from the side walls if what's coming from the side walls happens before 30 milliseconds. And as you're traveling at 240 meters a second in air, you can work out that your room mustn't be more than about 20 meters wide. Otherwise your brain goes, oh, I can hear the walls. It's an echo from over there. Not an echo, but it's coming from over there. If it's less than that, your brain goes, blimey, what's coming from over there sounds like it's coming from over here. And actually you get this enormous source called source widening. So the orchestra sounds huge because you've got a narrow room. As soon as you go to a wide room, the source actually becomes quite sharp again and becomes quite small. So it's a really interesting phenomenon that. And width is key. The great concert halls in the world are narrow. The crap ones are wide. <laughs> Barbican, Festival Hall, the Albert Hall, basically anything in London. <laughs> crap. <laughs> Apart from Milton Court and King's Place. Uh, platform and reflector design. Um, some concert halls, uh, the larger they are, the higher they are, you do need to put orchestral reflectors into the musicians can hear themselves. Um, and that does affect strength and loudness because it's also transmitting energy to the audience. Um, how far you away from the platform? Again, the further away you are, the quieter it will get. <coughs> Clarity. Width is key. That early energy gets into your ears so your brain can't decipher it from the direct sound is absolutely critical. And detailed geometry. Cue ball reflections is what we call them. If you have a balcony overhang on the side, the sound hits the walls, hits the other side of the balcony and comes back to you. And that helps to reinforce the direct sound and the sound off the side walls. It also helps to is populate what we call an impulse response. And I'll come on to what that means in a bit. That's really key. Again, reflected design. Spaciousness, apparent source width, is what I was talking about. Width. You can see there's a pattern emerging here, but what's important in the design, right? Um, again, the next one, intimacy. Again, it's distance. You need to feel that you are really involved in what's going on. If you're, if you're sitting in a concert hall and you're, you think, I could be sitting and listening to a big stereo, which is what the barbican sounds like, basically. It's like something's happening over there. You're not immersed in it. Again, that's width, that's, that's intimacy, that's feeling you're part of what's going on. Um, again, visual intimacy is important as well, which is why it's really nice to have balconies that wrap around it. Architecturally, it's really important. Again, I'll just whisk through these pieces onto a big size. Internal quality, that's quite important. Some rooms sound nasty and harsh. But there's other rooms you can't really hear the room. Um, and it's all to do with the amount of diffusion of what the surface materials are. What tends to work well is when you have a range of materials. And when you have a range of geometries, so small, medium and large elements of diffusion. In our concert halls, and it's very clear by this one, this is the uh, Amaranth Fleming of College Music. Um, you have columns, you have pilasters, you have clear street things, you know, you've got bits of gilded stuff everywhere, you know, it's all about them. just naturally, because they don't want to make it look fancy, or just naturally provides diffusion. If you go into a contemporary space, you know, there aren't many architects who have actually built something like this. 
anymore. And so you have to find a new language to actually develop your fusion. And that is quite a challenge, actually. Um, seat design, again, really important in tonal quality. Um, and the last one, I think, orchestral balance. Orchestral arrays suspended above the orchestra, like this, this lot here that we, um, we did record Jason not long ago. Um, this actually helps the orchestra hear themselves. It also kills the focusing of the barrel ball, the ceiling which is absolutely catastrophic in this room. Uh, and it also helps to get some early energy to the audience so they can actually hear more clearly. So it, it's a, a triple whammy is actually dealing with the platform conditions. That's really important, the same before. Some of the most beautiful moments in a performance are when there's nothing going on. It's those moments of silence when everyone holds their breath. And at that point, you can hear a pump on the trains outside, it's, it's killed the magic. Um, yes, those are all very exciting. These are all the things that you have to get right if you're going to design a world-class concert hall. Okay, so when you're having to talk to your architect and try to explain why you need to hang these things over the platform, because it doesn't look pretty or because it doesn't fit in with their architectural intent, you have to be able to articulate what will suffer if they don't do this? And that, I think, nicely brings me on to the sound lab, because we have the ability now, thanks to the advancing technology uh, and computing power becoming affordable, um, to actually organise our designs. So we have a room in London where we can sit and listen to what our spaces will sound like if we build them. We can listen to options, we can bring the client in, and they can decide um, whether they want a wide room or a narrow room or a balcony or two balconies. Um, and we, we design in a collaborative way based on what you can hear rather than being dictatorial. So it actually is incredibly powerful when you design it. So, fundamentally, if I clap my hands, it's pretty gentle, isn't it? The sound that comes from my hands to your ears is this red arrow. <coughs> what you then get are the reflections off the side walls and the reflections off the ceiling. Cue ball, that's a cue ball like that, coming back at you. Turn from the back wall. And the intensity that they come back at you is a function of how far away the wall is, or the ceiling is, and the surface material, whether it's absorbent or reflective, and the diffusion, whether it's scattering the energy or it's actually giving you a completely specular reflection coming straight back at you. So if you, if you add all of this lot up graphically, um, you get what we call an impulse response. So that's my hand clap, and that's coming straight at you. And then a series of other reflections coming at different time intervals. Because, again, the sound travels at 340 meters a second, it's constant in air. Pretty much anyway. Um, so the distance from the walls is actually a function of time. And so you end up with this is uh, amplitude, if you like, this is how strong the reflection is, and this is the time. And this is called an impulse response. And that is completely unique <coughs> to that performer position and where you're sitting. So it's different for everybody in the room. So what we do, we can, uh, we can obtain this from a computer model. Or we can obtain it by actually measuring it in the room. We can actually go in and do a balloon burst or a gunshot, or a, we do with electronic sweeps now because we're not allowed to carry guns. Um, it's never fun anymore. Um, so once you've actually got that, there's a very complicated mathematical process called convolution. And it's a mathematical process whereby this impulse response is convolved with music or sounds, any sound that has been obtained in an anechoic chamber, where it has no echo, no room effect at all, just pure sound. And you end up with being able to listen to that anechoic music in that concert hall. So it's a very complicated process, but it means that you can actually hear what the room will sound like in different locations. We, we always sit like third of the way back in the stalls and on the first afternoon and so back. And you can compare one concert hall with another, which you've never been able to do before. 
in the past to listen to different concert was you had to jump on a plane and visit and hope that they were playing something that you knew. Whereas now you can actually switch between different concert halls with the same orchestra playing the same music at the same time. And it's amazing when you do that how you can hear the walls change, how you can hear the reverberance and the clarity change. Because your oral memory is rubbish. If you actually play it in one concert hall and then play the same thing in the next one, you've almost forgotten before it starts again. But if you can change during the musical phrase, it's really easy to hear the differences. So what do you mean that that computer model can kind of simulate an actual piece of music and if you listen to it as a lay person you can really get a feel for how it sounds? Yes. Yes, that's exactly what we do. So, broadly speaking, impulse response, music, uh, yeah, music runs some in the other, uh, impulse response here, multiply with some other kind of music, sitting in the sound lab you actually hear what Raj is listening to. And again, the system to the graphical representation and a very large man in a very small concert hall. I like to think it's a stage. Um, and this is the sound up here reproducing the sound and the reflections coming back at you at certain times. So we use this for benchmarking. So we have some of the great halls in the world. Uh, we've we've cali got calibrated recordings of them. We can compare them with our own designs. We can compare them with some of the crap designs around. Um, it's, so it's a really valuable exercise. And we have, there's nine on there. We've got, we've got some other three, I think. Glasgow, we've got Glasgow there. We just don't really in Manchester. Just completely go off while we land. We'll back to this other one. So, that's how we listen to things and how we design things now. So, being through some of the geometrical stuff that's important and then how we actually work with it and listen to it. I've got some project examples to run through. Um, and then we'll start with the Sage from Gates Head. Jason could probably tell you more about this <coughs> than me anyway, but um, I see he's a project architect. I don't know how many of you have been or, or know of the Sage. It is a fantastic hotel. I, I would say that. Um, tell you it is. Um, it's actually three venues in one and a music school. Incredibly complicated building. Um, and the main hall is a 1650 seat symphonic room. It's actually a slightly small symphonic room. Uh, so it was designed for the Northern Symphonia, who at the time were called kind of 50, 60 piece band, have actually grown since then. Um, <coughs> this room is 20 metres wide between the um, stall circle, um, which is just on the cusp of being as wide as you want to get that lateral ending I was talking about. We have lots of soffits where we can get our impulse responses to fill in that impulse response. You don't want a big, a big chancel and a gap and then some more stuff. You actually want nicely rich impulse response. So you get that from horizontal surfaces in the room. This actually has the benefit of the ceiling that you can see there, the, uh, the horizontal um, the stripy bits, if you like. They're actually reflect reflectors that can go up about <coughs> 8 metres or so and change the volume of the room. And they can come down to this level and close off the balcony as well for conference use. So it's a very sophisticated room. And it's actually based on one of these classic rooms. I mean, this is one of the, arguably one of the finest rooms in Europe. It's in the uh, in Vienna. Uh, geometrically, it's very similar to the Sage, uh, but this has all of the comfort of the bus shelter. Um, <laughs> you, you would never design uh, a concert hall with this seating capacity anymore. Um, because you're sitting like this. Um, similarly, you wouldn't have flat floor, yet you'd like to have a rake so that everyone can actually see rather than just looking at the person in front. Um, but as you can see, you know, it's actually very diffuse. It's got balcony overhangs, it's got all sorts of bits and bobs that work beautifully well. It's narrow and it's tall. So, that of the key elements, this room is brilliant. And the stage, as you can see, is very similar to this. It's actually a bit wider. It has a similar seating capacity, um, but it's comfortable. 
So the ceiling panels move, as you can see, these go up and down, but what they actually do is they change the reflection sequence from the orchestra to the audience. And we went through a great deal of um, commissioning when the stage first opened. In fact, before it opened, we went through three months or so with the Northern Symphonia and with rock bands and pop and folk and world, and you name any conceivable sort of music that was likely to go on in this place. And we pre-commissioned the room because we knew that we wouldn't have the time or the patience of the musicians for us to actually fiddle with all of the bits you can change in the room while they were present. So what we actually did in the sound lab here is one of the first things we did actually was we built a computer model of, of the Sage because uh, the Sage, the original design was actually done prior to having a sound lab. And we listened to different configurations of the ceiling panels. So we pre-commissioned the commissioning in the sound lab. So we went up with a rough idea of where everything needed to be so that when the musicians were playing, when they nipped off to have a fag at the, the interval or whatever, uh, we could then just, just, just nudge them slightly and just tweak. So these are some of the various different configurations that he had set in. Um, and that's quite an important one. That's a, a variable absorbent drape that comes out at high level and kills what we call the top hat, the top bit of the room. And that just kills stone dead in the room and stuff like that. So that's a photograph looking from the choir up at the room. Um, all of these surfaces <coughs> are diffusing, um, as is the wall. The walls, actually, we took a what we call a fractal approach to diffusion in this room, which is small scale diffusion applied to big diffusion. So the whole walls actually go in big curves but actually you've got moulded, uh, smaller diffusion on top. So the, the smaller stuff does the high frequencies, and the big stuff does the low frequency. So that's the view from there, and that's it in its amplified mode. Um, acoustic drapes pop out and cover up the wall surfaces and kill the room acoustic in time. So that for like amplified use, you don't want to hear the room. You just want to hear it from the next speakers. I have loads of uh, mock-ups and samples. Um, anything about that you want, Jason? Look at that. Let's change the day on it. <laughs> um, as you can see, it's a very diffuse room. Very diffuse. In fact, at the top there, you can see the wave of the low frequency and high frequency diffusion. Um, so that's the view from the front. So that's a symphonic room. Now this one is a little recital room. Similar principles. You want reflecting soffits, you want cute more reflections, um, you want it to be narrow, you need enough volume for the receipts that you've got present. Um, but the width, again, whilst it's key, actually is important as it's narrow. So a recital room will typically be about 14 metres wide. You don't really want it much more than that. So this is a, for those of you who came to Paul's actually, I think you saw quite a lot of this anyway. Um, that was an existing building, and this is a new building here, and this is the concert hall this bit. Um, it sits out on its own, it's actually a completely isolated, structurally separate volume within uh, all of the surrounding back, back of the house stuff. Going to look through these. Incredibly um, complicated when you look at it. Um, I don't think you can make it any more complicated if you try. Um, we have some very important elements in the ceiling. Um, there's actually coping. We discovered a few years back that having a right angle at the top of the top, we call it a top hat where the room steps up. Um, and it starts at uh, this point here. And then you get a really useful reflection on that side. And then it comes up and it joins onto the ceiling. And where it joins on, if that's actually curved, like a traditional cone the energy that comes back off that is really important, it's really strong. If it's a right angle, 
the sound has to hit two surfaces before it comes back, whereas if it's a cone, it doesn't. And so you end up with a stronger reflection coming from that surface, and it makes the room sound very much bigger. It's a really interesting phenomenon, and it's one of the things that we actually listen to and, and play with in the sound lab. Um, and when we, came, when, when we sort of discovered this, um, that became one of our important design elements that we've carried on with all of our smaller uh, recyclable designs. It's more important in smaller rooms than, than big symphonic rooms. It's probably to do with the fact that you can hear those reflections very clearly because they're not very far away. I mean, this, this ceiling is typically 13 metres away, whereas in the sage it's like 25 metres away. So the energy that comes back is very much stronger and very much more apparent. So a quick, a quick comparison. Um, that's with, uh, where are we? That's with King's Place. Who's been to King's Place? Um, quite a traditional looking room, very rectilinear. Uh, the purple one is the Royal Welsh overlay, which could not be more different, actually. Tall, a little bit wider. It's actually aligned with the front of the stage. Um, but King's Place does have probably 100 seats more, so this is, this is a bigger room. And this is it compared with the Wigmore. Um, again, they could not be more different, um, which is why the world was so brilliant and we more. Not my favourite room. And this is what the room looks like. Um, this has an interesting approach to diffusion here. This is very uh, fine diffusion in this, this point. Because what you get off the sidewalls, again, I'm saying it's really important for the lateral energy. In order to be harsh, and one of my complaints, if you like, uh, about the Wigmore is that I think it's a very harsh sounding room, and those side walls are marble. There are some fake columns in there, but it's, it's predominantly marble and timber panelling that's flat, so there's very little diffusion. What this does is it actually it, it breaks up the high frequencies, and it actually gives it that it softens the sound without actually reducing its impact. And here we have um, varying depth columns, if you like, that join up to the balcony front. And these balcony fronts are tilted back because when we did the analysis in this small room, there's only 400 seats or so, 450, I think, there's too much energy, too much early energy getting onto the stalls and not enough on the balconies. So these balcony fronts are actually tipped back, so any incidents sound actually spread up rather than down. And that's a view from the balcony. We also introduced some fixed absorption, which is very unusual um, on the back of the balcony front here. Um, and that was primarily because the volume to get the, the um, strength correct in the room uh, meant that it really should have had more seats in it. And the college couldn't afford more seats, so we actually put in some fixed absorption. So, talking about impulse responses, um, this is uh, not an explosion in the paint factory, but it's actually um, a coloured graphic of an analysis of the impulse response measured at that seat position in this room. And if you look up there, you can see the colours give you an indication of which direction the sound's coming from and the time. So the red is from a, uh, uh, an impulse on the stage. The red is coming straight at you, very frontal, straight at you. So I don't know what the instrument was that this would be. And then you have the blue, which is the lateral energy coming off the sidewalls, which is the next, which comes within the, that 30 milliseconds I'm talking about. The blue actually is coming from um, the ceiling, coming from above in the coping. Uh, and the yellow is the reverberant sound. And this just comes from everywhere. This is after, after about 80 milliseconds, the sound just keeps going round, and you can't, there's no direction associated with it. So it's really key that all of these four different areas work together. And again, that's just looking at it um, from the platform. So that's what I'm going to talk about with the, uh, the Royal Welsh. Um, this is uh, a concert hall called Milton Court, uh, the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. This opened just over a year ago. I don't know how many of you been. Very good. <laughs> um, 
This is a uh, 650 seat multi-purpose room, primarily for the students, but the barber can also use it for their chamber series. So the barber can rent it out for 50 concerts a year and put on their own performance. It's international repertoire uh, when they have it. Um, and this is, I'm just going to show you some of the typical design work we do on, on a, a room like this. On day one, this is the sort of information we might use an architect. We're given the basic dimensions, whether we need reflectors or not, what the rake should be, um, if you want a balcony, a wraparound balcony, whether we need a top hat, uh, whether coding should be, all that sort of stuff. And very broad dimensions. So they take that away, and hopefully they'll come up with a design that actually follows our recommendations and after much fighting this was a computer generated graphic that, uh, that um, actually this was their fundraising graphic I think. Um, which actually looks remarkably similar to the uh, appalling sketch that I did about 20 years ago. Um, again you can see we have overhangs, very small overhangs here actually, and there's top hat and there's, uh, here we actually don't have uh, coding as such, we actually had a series of rectangles that actually approximate a uh, coding. This is a very tall room, this is 15 metres high. Because it's so tall, we have to have an orchestral reflector array. The previous one, the Royal Welsh, is a couple of metres lower and it's on that cusp, we don't actually need it there. But it's amazing, if you fly these out of the way, the room sounds completely different. It's really, really important. Mm. And that's a graphic um, that the architect had appreciated. We got the scale of his people wrong, um, like midgets. Never made that mistake, new architects present. Certainly not when you stick on all the posters and flyers that you're trying to fundraise with. That's an HD student. Up here we have some interesting uh, cast plaster work. Um, that provides, what you tend to do is like to have fairly fine diffusion at low level and quite chunky at high level. Um, and this was that the architect's uh, view of how to do that, which is uh, great big plaster triangles almost uh, popping out of the walls. Um, it's actually very beautifully executed, uh, if you ever get a chance to go. It's on Silk Street uh, by the Barbican. This is section three, part section three. And you can see I've highlighted all of the important elements that give us filling in the impulse response. All key elements. You can't take them out. And this again, it just shows how complicated these sorts of buildings are. The pink, if it is pink, um, is actually all a floating structural springs. And it has, even, even down to the uh, stage wagons and the stage risers, it's all resiliently supported because you've got the tube lines almost immediately underneath. But more important than that, you've got studio theatre immediately underneath. And you've got TV studio as well. So it's incredibly complicated. Everything has to float, everything has to be isolated as you come in. Uh, you have to have resilient isolation joints around all the doors, all the floors, all the services. Um, you know, right down to sprinkler pipes, um, the electrical conduits, it's very complicated. Accessible attic at the top where all the technical stuff's flown. <laughs> and again, that's another section. So in plan, <coughs> you try and build in a very simple rectilinear way. So this is a floating box. And then all of the circulation is within the floating box. So all the shaping and the formwork is, is actually within. Um, this has, very similar to the Royal Welsh, um, the ability to extend the platform almost halfway down the room so the school can put their symphony orchestra on and they can actually rehearse in there. We told them that's fine, but never ever have a concert with the full orchestra on the platform. So the opening concert. We had Beethoven 9 with a 200 choir and full symphonic orchestra, and everyone's ears were bleeding. It was horrible. Um, but you, client to clients, they'll do, they'll do as they see fit, not what is best for them. So, this is a typical wide frame model. Um, an acoustic model is very different from a, an architectural one. 
We don't put fine detail in because the, the more detail you put in, the longer the computational palette takes to actually sort it out. And you get to a point where the computers will just fall over. So you're limited with the number of surfaces you can put in. Um, and if you visualize those, it looks pretty rubbish. But actually, that's exactly what you need it to look like in order to do its job. And these are the sorts of plots we get out. It's a program called Odeon. It's a commercially available. Um, and it gives you all of the indices that you want to look at. This is reverberation time at one kilohertz. And it gives you lovely kind of plots. You can see roughly what your RT is and how it varies, how the, the different things vary across the room. And you can see there's, a, you know, you can identify various hotspots and try and investigate what's going wrong. So we have things like um, that was reverberation time. This is early decay time. Um, this one is uh, what's that, lateral fraction. So that's, that's what comes from the sides. Um, I think this one should be the clarity. Clarity is a mix of the direct sound with the reverberant sound. Um, and obviously, this, this is showing a very clear to not very clear range. The red is incredibly clear when you're almost on the platform. You know, if you're playing, and then obviously you're getting all the direct sound and not very much reverberant sound. So actually, you get more clarity at the back of a concert hall, if you're under a balcony like that, because you're getting that energy reflected off the soffit and off the back wall back at you that's reinforcing the direct sound. So this space in the middle of the stalls is where you get the best blend of the direct to reverberant together with the balcony. So the first balcony generally are the best seats in the house. So I just wanted to show you a little bit about subtle changes that we uh, we have to fight big battles over. This is one of them. Um, let's almost spot the difference there. But the, that was the architect's initial uh, design, and this is what we modified it to. And what we actually ended up with was slightly twisting this balcony front here to get more energy on the balcony. And it involved changing the parapet um, of the side balcony profile from one that was pointing down, sends you to one that was vertical, but it's still convex, and twists as it goes around. So you can see it very subtly twists as it's going around. Um, and that results in very much more spread of early energy. It's a, a just spectral, essentially, first and second order inflection. So sound from the orchestra hits the red, which is about in front, and it's reflected, and you see it just hits a few splodges on the, on the balcony there. This one, which is more convex and more optimised, actually is spreading the energy much more evenly across there. And that's the finished concert hall with these very unusual, if you sit in the balcony, certainly very unusual curves to these balcony fronts that are actually acoustically driven, entirely acoustically driven. So it's a beautiful room, it's a very unusual room, it's all the wood's called Sapini, it's, um, it's a, uh, a red hardwood, um, and it's an extraordinary sounding room. I encourage you to go down and listen. And this is the last one I'm going to talk about. This is called Storm, in, and that's pronounced Buddha. It's not Bodo. Um, now, I don't know if any of you know where it is. If you've ever been on a Norwegian cruise, you've probably been there. Um, it's a port above the Arctic Circle. It doesn't look like that very often. Um, it looks like that a lot. Uh, it's actually very beautiful looking out, but it was flattened in the war, so the whole place is just a bunch of wooden shacks. And the Norwegian government have this policy that they like to um, invest in the north, otherwise all the youth migrate south to Oslo and they never go back home again, so they have an aging and dying population up north. And part of their, uh, they're trying to reinvigorate the North by building cultural buildings for a reason for people to stay. And this was one of those buildings. So we have a 150 million pound uh, three venue concert hall. The largest uh, venue in the building is a thousand seats. Uh, in a town that has 35,000 people. Half the people came in the whole town came to the opening. Um, I think they're hoping for some passing trade by the ferries. And, and it is a fabulous place in summer to go uh, actually to the fields. It's just an extraordinary place. 
Um, it's quite hostile as well. We have uh, a military base. <laughs> we had uh, value engineering. This is for those of you who've been through the painful process of trying to design a building. Um, we had a double structure around the console so that these things could fly over without disturbing what was going on in the concert hall. Uh, it turns out um, they only fly over on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So uh, the value engineering was, uh, we lost the whole roof structure um, and I accepted on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, you'll hear the jets. Um, and that's the war, I suppose. Um, but they are extraordinarily noisy. They wanted an international quality concert hall. Um, they also needed a theatre that we could uh, accept touring amplified shows, i.e., Mamma Mia, Cats, that sort of stuff that, that puts bombs on seats. For that, you need a 30 metre high fly tower, you need wing space, all of the things you can't possibly have in a concert hall. Oh, they also use it for conference as well, of course. Um, and recording and broadcasting. So the traditional route is that you build a theatre and you put an orchestra show on the platform and you've got an orchestra and I accept it would be crap. You could do that. An alternative would be to put an electroacoustic enhancement system in the theatre space so that provides some electronic reverberance, if you like. But fundamentally, a theatre is different shapes of concert hall. And as I said right at the beginning, a theatre needs half the volume that a concert hall needs. So you could use an electroacoustic system, but they didn't want it. They didn't want any of those solutions, and we were sent away, having got to stage C and designed it being costed and the cost plan being fixed, and then decided they didn't want that. They wanted something which was going to have a world class acoustic for orchestral use and be a fully functioning uh, receiving house for theatre. So we set about thinking how we could do this um, by moving things, basically. Of course, there's no additional fee for moving anything or budget for moving anything. Um, and we came up with this idea that actually, the auditorium, because there's only a thousand seats, no one's, no one's terribly far away. It can actually be quite an intimate space. You can make it rectangular, you can make it tall enough, just about. We're actually about 18 metres high. The difficult thing is what you do from the proscenium this way. How do you get rid of that damn great fly tower and make it into a concert hall when you've actually got an orchestra on the platform? So this is a section during, for, for theatre mode. So we have a proscenium arch and we have our legs and, and headers and what have you. So it looks like a proper theatre. Um, <coughs> and what we have in concert mode is this. The header, sorry, the, um, the proscenium leg hinges back. The header hinges up. The back hinges up. Two panels that are actually flown in the fly tower and stored fly down and twist and fill these in. And these side panels are 14 metre high panels that are, we, that are tracked like a great big moving wall and locked into place. And then through these uh, reflectors, uh, sorry, through this large reflector, the orchestral array is flown. That gives us a room here it's nice and clean and clear, plenty of volume, right width, everything works well. In theatre mode, it's too reverberant because it's got twice the volume like you need. But when you open up the theatre, there's loads of absorption in the fly tower. Essentially, you halve the volume because you ignore the fly tower because it's full of absorption. Every other panel here becomes absorbent. And there's actually a lighting bridge that's parked up here. If you notice, there's a beautiful clean ceiling and it's actually tracked out and you can have a lighting bridge position wherever you like. So it's a very clever system. We had nowhere to store anything on site, so this is looking at the proscenium. 
Um, you see the stored panels in the fly tower here, and the stored panels that are uh, hung on the sidewalk. And that all performs that. You can do one blow, certainly two blows, you can do that in an hour. It's, it's not automated, but everything's easy to move. And it was, it was all designed using standard automotive tried and tested track and uh, electronics. So it's, it's, it's not innovative in the sense of new engineering, but it's innovative in the sense of this has never been done in a concert hall before. So these are unusual architectural engineers. Um, we like this sort of pencil. Again, we have got two nice things back in the place. I'm to show you a bit. Um, this is an all in different sort of So that's computer rendering. These are our absorbent panels that are deployed. Um, the proscenium is in place. And that's in concert mode. The absorbent panels have disappeared. Tracking panels have cleared. Ceilings up. Orchestra reflectors are in place. And looking from the audience, from the, uh, the, the platform back, and that's what we want to do. And that's a, a photograph of commissioning. So it, it turned out uh, very similar to the renderings. Um, it sounds fantastic. All of this is calcium silicates, calcium silicate, yes, which is a really hard material. It's normally used to raise floors. It's beautifully hard, fabulous to machine. You get really crisp detailing in it. The whole ceiling's optimized to get early energy onto the balcony. So we have some um, convex and concave elements. All of this is, is exactly the same. So wherever you sit in the room on the balconies, you're getting as much early energy as is possible to get. And projection these days is so good that that's actually a projection of a Norwegian fjord from the back of the room onto wood. It's not even onto a screen. Which was, I was staggered to be honest. Now this may or may not work. Oh, there yeah. So this is um, an optimization routine that was run to uh, actually to identify the, the optimum profile of the balcony shots to get that early energy on the balconies as even as possible. And this is, uh, this is Galapagos plug into Grasshopper, which is all of that stuff. Um, and it does millions and millions and millions of options, and it comes up with the, uh, the, the most suitable, or actually gives you the best solution. So once you set this up and running, uh, it's a simple geometrical process, um, but of course it does far more options than you could possibly think of doing. That one forever, so it's Now this should work on its own. Um, there's some crappy bits of video I've got to show you now, that will end on. Um, this shows the header moving, the orchestral reflectors, this is times 32, I think it's, it's, it's the, uh, This is all we could catch while they were setting up for the oil opening. Um, uh, Prince, uh, Prince, I don't know his name. Anyway, he turned up. What's <laughs> <coughs> that? That one's finished. Um, He's removing the stage, the, the stage sideboard. Surprisingly easy to move. And this is one of the hinge panels that the cell support. This one's a little bit tedious, this one. Um, everything has to fly out of the way. This is the, the upstage grid in the fly tower. And when this is down, all of the bars that uh, fly all the scenery have to fly past, so all of the support system actually has to collapse. Which all works like beautifully. And this is all, all, of, the, all of these elements, they're all plywood elements. But it's all 
as thin as it can possibly be structurally, but it needed to be very stiff acoustically. Uh, and that took a, a great deal of fiddling and playing and head scratching. Um, there's a lot of diffusion applied to it, and the diffusion actually helps with stiffness. Um, oh yeah, these are the uh, sidewall panels taken on the phone as they open and close. Got the beautiful things there, little garages. So that takes the auditorium from a live condition to a dead condition. So can you just say the diffusion was quite low? Yes. How did you do that? Screw it. It's batten, it's just timber batten. Oh, it's the way it's fixed in? Yes. yes. And this is the uh, moving writing bridge. Which is very beautiful. It parks against the proscenium, so you, it's completely invisible during concert use. And you can get to all the lighting bars and, and put your lights in the right position and maintain them from it. Or you can use it as a lighting position during theatre use. So that was photographed that during the, uh, the opening concert. Building of the only AJ. Um, and that's quite a nice quote. And the interesting thing is during this opening concert, nobody in the audience was aware that it was actually a theatre earlier in the day. They thought it was just a concert hall. Because it looks like one and it sounds like one. So it's like from the harbour outside. And I'm going to shut up now because that's 55 minutes and 18 seconds. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, can you answer a few questions? Just before we go to the questions, I just want to let everyone know uh, just a, a little bit of housekeeping that next week's uh, lecture on optimization in acoustic design, which I'm about to ask Ian on, um, next week's uh, lecture has been moved from next week to the 12th of March. So Thomas Mendes from ETH is going to be on the 12th of March and not next week. So we have a break next week. So please come back on the top. Now, Ian, um, and also we have drinks after the questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, IEDE. Now, uh, the question I want to ask is that I think uh, the, the last Buddha is a fascinating piece of like a, almost like a transformer, the way it locks together and adapts itself in this new situation. Do you think that economically this is the way that new halls will be procured for new cities? in that it's a one-stop shop, it does everything, and you press a button and it all flips around. Yes. Is that a good thing or not? Well, actually, interestingly enough, I said the, the cost plan was fixed when we were actually told that they didn't want what had been designed, which was an orchestra shop and an electroacoustic system. So we had that sum of money to play with to make all of that work actually designed and built and installed and that. So all of those moving elements came out the same price as buying an orchestra, a traditional orchestra show and electro system. And you end up with something that's excellent for both uses, rather than something that's all right for theatre and crap for everything else. So I think, it, I personally think that is the future. <coughs> and one of the reasons we, we couldn't have an orchestra show actually, which drove this whole design process, was there's nowhere to store it. Because that actually hangs in the wind space. It's so do you think that John Newell's new building in Paris, which also is a transformer, press a button and it's a jack of all trade, do you think that, that is also a similar example no. of this type of thing? No, I mean that, that's only a concert, it only does music at a conference. Uh, it doesn't do theatre, it hasn't got a flight tower. Um, you can reconfigure the stage arrangement and the upstage stage and the choir and what have you, but it's just things, but it's not, it's not a change of use, actually. Or do you think that's just far too complicated? Um, I think all that you could ever do in an existing space is to hire 
um, an, an off-the-shelf shelf, if you like. Mm. And it stays performances even though the Royal Opera House do them from time to time, and you know, it sells out because everyone wants to go and listen to the Royal Opera House Orchestra play something. Mm. So there's a lot to be said for that, but obviously starting from scratch, if you could design a fabulous room for orchestral music as well, then, then, then you would, or you should. I was just wondering if you've got dense materials that are exposed, like exposed concrete or brickwork or round earth. Is there a particular part of the hall where you want this to be, like a little bit higher or back? Or uh, all of those materials are fine, actually, in the course of all. Um, what you do need to do is to try and have variance in them. Um, and concrete in itself isn't a problem. Um, but what musicians like is to be surrounded by timber, at least around the platform and around the stalls area. What you do in the rest of the building, they don't really care, but around where they can see. Again, it's this whole thing, if they're comfortable, they'll play better. If they expect to see them below. But if you're surrounded with stainless steel, it could sound absolutely fine, but they'll say, oh, it sounds a bit metallic in here. You know. <laughs> Immediately, you've got that. If you were to blindfold them and say, you just go and play here, uh, they wouldn't be able to tell the difference. When you said variants, what does that mean? Um, changes in materials and changes in um, diffusion, so depths of, of, of uh, patterning, if you like. So higher up in the room, nice big chunky things, lower down quite fine. And it could all be concrete. Um, so most of the concrete colors you show, concert halls you show have a vertical lattice structure for diffusion. Do you have any experience with horizontal lattice structures? The reason it's vertical is because the vertical, I'm not priest, vertical <laughs> uh, diffusion uh, diffuses sound in a horizontal plane. Mm -hmm. If you had horizontal diffusion, it would send it in a vertical plane, it would be sending it up into the gods, where actually you wanted to, you wanted to spread it across the audience plane. So you, you always put diffusion, always. You try and uh, put diffusion certainly around the stores in a vertical plane. Okay. But Milton Court, it actually does in and out at a high level. Um, so that's more of a, a vertical diffusion, which is a horizontal diffusion. Um, but it doesn't matter so much if I work in the room with that. I'm asking this with regards to the um, Ndika Valley building, or the Chamber Hall in Amsterdam, because they have the whole concert hall is basically horizontal like structures and the acoustic elements are hidden behind those. <coughs> I was wondering what your opinion is. Yeah. The whole concept of having uh, essentially a, a, an acoustically transparent lattice work with something going on behind it that's doing the acoustic stuff is something that we don't really like to do because that, that lattice work in itself is providing a lot of absorption. It's also becoming frequency dependent because it's very regular. As soon as you have regularity and cavity behind you, start getting cone filtering and all sorts of absorption properties that you don't want, it starts to get that peaky absorption. So we would always avoid doing that. It's just a risky thing to do. Mm -hmm. we keep it for the mm -hmm. Apart from the balcony fronts, where it could be horizontal, because then you do actually want to send it as well. Okay, thank you all very much. And I, oh, there's one more question. Is there a question? Are you stretching? Have you played before with a interface in order to increase or reduce the sound in, in this way, in this auditory in the third of weight, some weight? You only have that sort of an issue when you have constant tones. When you have music is, is, is never constant tones, it's always changing, so it's temporarily quite varied. Um, and the other issue is to get standing weight in the space, you need a room, to be aware of them anyway, you need a relatively small room. All of these, the, the fundamental and the probably the first and second order harmonics are so low, they're all sub audio anyway. Okay, Ian, thank you very much. <laughs>